Okay, our uh, topic today, the basics of speaking in tongues. So I thought we'd talk about that. I've had the thought uh, a little while back and been slowly putting it together. Speaking in tongues is uh, a gift of the Holy Spirit and it fulfills two or three different things as well. And I thought so many people don't know that God gave tongues as a sign, that he gave uh, tongues uh, is something that you would utilise in prayer to God. So it's a personalised prayer language. And thirdly, uh, tongues could be used as a gift at the operation of the voice gifts in the part of the meeting, which is all very clearly defined in Scripture. And uh, look, the notes I'm reading from, I'll be handing them out for those who want them. They'll be available at the end of the meeting, and there's a lot more I could do. But to qualify every possible point that I might raise today would take far too long, and we can't do that. But we'll cover the points of the uh, points of interest and the points which can be debatable with some people, and just see what the Bible says. Now, the first thing I'd like to observe that God chose tongues to be a sign, not our church. Jesus Christ said, these signs will follow them that believe. He also mentioned those that believe, not by the way. So it was very clear-cut difference between believers and non-believers with their commitment to baptism, water baptism, and then following on and receiving the Holy Spirit where God gave them the evidence, his evidence, not our evidence, and something from him, not from us, that we'd received the Holy Spirit because we spoke in tongues. And God has then furnished numerous details through the New Testament. And some of the Old Testament prophecies open doors to understand speaking in tongues and the use of the Holy Spirit. And they're there so that we can put ourselves in the best spiritual place possible with the available knowledge that we have on the earth. And that's a good thing to have because it's very clear. As we'll go through this, you'll see it self-explaining. And it's not a complex Bible study. It's just a simple dealing of facts of things that God said and what we can expect. And that's all we, uh, we aim to do is just promote what God has asked us to do. And we keep in mind that the gospel in the Bible, even though the Bible's a very complex book and there are complexities of doctrine and purpose and everything, the message to the unsaved and the message for the way that you live your life is simple and clear and it's spelt out that you can take your Bible out and read it and see exactly what I'm saying yourself. So there's no complexity. We're not going to twist and, uh, and sort of weld together three or four scriptures to try and make something which is not obvious. Everything we're talking about today is obvious and on the surface and clearly read in simple English from your Bible. Let's go to the first uh, scriptural reference, Acts 2.1. We know the day of Pentecost, we covered it a couple of weeks ago, but I need to start off here just simply to set the scene so we're all on the same page with our understanding. And one of the things that we do, when we talk about what God is doing in our life, it's no longer about our feelings. It's no longer about our personal beliefs. It's what God is doing. And that's what we stand on. We stand on the power of God. Because I, I could come down the front here and say, oh, look, I gave my life to the Lord 20 years ago and it was just so right because I could feel it in my heart and that's all fine, but I could be a fruit loop and I could say the same thing, but I could also be highly intelligent and say the same thing. There is no discerning difference that way if I make a claim about how I feel. I would rather make a claim about what God said and what God has done and say that what God has said to me is now happening in my life because that is provable and it's scripturally sound, and it puts us in a known place, which we all want if we're going to serve the Lord, because life and death is the goal. Death isn't our goal, but life and death is the goal of people's choices, and uh, I'd rather choose to live forever. And uh, you, I don't know, when you were younger, when I was younger, we used to get a, a packet of something in the letterbox. It'd be a trial run, like a little packet of rinse or something for the detergent, and you'd give it a go, and if you liked it, you could go and buy it and get the real thing. I believe in a like manner, our life on the earth is a trial run. God has given us a sample of what is possible for the future. By we're born, we have a life, and this time on earth, according to geological time, is minuscule. Of the 14 billion years that they estimate the, uh, the galaxy has uh, been in existence, if we're lucky, we'll get 100 years, which is a, you know, sort of triple zero decimal, even lower than that. Our time on Earth is not even a smidgen. It's not even a millimetre of a kilometre. It's a trial run. 
And God says, well, while you're here, I'll give you a couple of choices. You can make the most of your time on earth your way, or you can set yourself up my way, and you can go on and have this sample forever. And that was my choice, and I think it's the bulk of the choice everyone's taken. I know when Jesus Christ returns, everyone's going to wish that that was the choice they made, but we know by, from Bible prophecy that sadly the bulk of humanity will not make that choice. And worse than that, I guess, for others, many will make choices which do not conform to scriptural directions, and they'll be making choices to live forever based on how they feel, what they believe, as opposed to what God is doing in their life, and opposed to scriptural directions, which is not good. That's why we choose to go to our Bible and say, this is what God said, this is what's happening in our life. God's backing up what we believe with signs following, not with feelings following, even though signs and miracles can create emotions and feelings, but we all respond emotionally differently than each other. But the power of God is equally the same. And as we discover all around the world where our fellowship's in somewhere like New Guinea or in Holland, Europe, America, Fiji, all the places around the world where we are now, uh, everyone in those places has exactly the same experience as the Bible said, and we're all the same. And our culture, even though we're varied and the age groups and the education standards and the gender, uh, male or female, young and old, we have a consistent theme everywhere we go, and it's a Bible theme. And I think we should be very thankful that we have an understanding which clarifies these things. But let's start where it started. The first occurrence where by speaking in tongues is recorded in the Bible, Acts 2.1. And I won't go through the detail, I'm just setting the scene so we can go on to the other points. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty uh, wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven or divided languages, and it came upon them in the manner of fire, or like as fire, and it sat upon each of them. Every person of the 120 who are praying to receive the Holy Spirit received. All of the 120 people all spoke in tongues. This was the first outpouring of what Jesus Christ had promised would come to the people. And on that day, we're told 3,000 further people received the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, according to the Bible record. And it goes on in verse 4 to say, to just qualify what I'm saying now, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and begin, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So we find that this event clearly describes and fulfills multitudes of Bible prophecy and promises. Jesus spoke about it. He said, these signs will follow them, but believe, and he will look at one of those. And Isaiah spoke about it. Zephaniah spoke about it. But we'll just quickly go through the logics of what God says about these matters now. We'll go to 1 Corinthians 14, 26. This is the basics, just in the background of general information. Then we get a little bit of specific purposing for speaking in tongues. Just read out very simple scriptures. And if you, if you don't particularly want to write your scriptures down, I've got the list I'm reading from. It will be available online also in three days, so you can download it from the internet site as a PDF or a Word file and uh, it'll be all there for you. But if you've got other notes you want to take, feel free. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Paul asks the question, how is it then, brethren? How is it? When you come together, every one of you, not just some of you, this is written to a Gentile church, this is written to people who are really second-generation choices from the past. The Gentiles never got God's blessing in this outward way. Here, now they've got it, Acts 10 and Acts 11 go into the details uh, of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit to all people. He said, how is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, every one of you has a doctrine, every one of you has a tongue. Every person in God's church had a tongue. They could all speak in tongues. Here it is, clearly defined in the Bible, not an optional extra, not something happens at level two in your spiritual development. Not something special to enable you to do something different as you mature in your walk in the Lord or whatever. Everyone, when they receive the Holy Spirit, speaks in tongues. Why? Because when we go through the purpose of speaking in tongues, we'll see why if you don't have the ability to speak in tongues, you cannot fulfill the salvation plan that God has for you. And you cannot build yourself up in the other plans he would like you to share the blessing with with other people equally so here it is very clear every one of you and it's just so simple very clearly there 
Acts 2.38. Back to where we were, just summarising. When they received the Holy Spirit, people came and gathered and they said, these people are speaking in tongues, and I, I won't go through all the details, but there were people from different parts of the countryside and where they came from, their home culture, their home cities. They spoke quite often other languages outside of the general language, which they all spoke when they gathered in Jerusalem, particularly on the day of Pentecost. It was a holy day, a righteous holiday, a righteous God-given uh, day of importance and significance. And they were there and they said, we hear people speaking in languages which are our languages. How would they know this? What's going on? And they asked all these questions and the result of other explanations, which we won't particularly deal with today because we're just sort of looking at the basics. He says in verse 38 of Acts 2, then Peter said unto them, the, the question they asked is, what shall we do? They were told that speaking in tongues was a sign of receiving the spirit, the the prophets of old had already dictated that this would come about. Jesus himself had already said this would come about. Then they were told that they were guilty for the death of Jesus Christ because they voted to have him killed rather than to let him be. And they, with all that in their mind, they said, well, what do we do? How do we fix this problem? And his solution was, and it's a solution to everyone in the world today equally, then Peter said unto them, repent, Repenting simply means give God a go. Turn your life or your thinking around and say, well, if God is true and there's something about this, um, I'm willing to give it a go to see what happens. I'm willing to make myself available so God can have an opportunity to work in me. Repenting, and, and that can be true all through life. It's just, well, if I've done this and it's not working, well, maybe I'll do it God's way. See what God can do with it because that's a form of repentance. So he said, repent, be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, with the view to the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is explaining what had happened. They'd received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then he went on to conclude how long this promise would be available for. He said in verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, meaning generationally in that family, and to all people in time, and all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So this receiving of the Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues was clearly defined as a New Testament manifestation of God for everyone who would call themselves a Christian. A lot of people today call themselves Christians because they believe God, but they believe in the Bible, but that does not make you a Christian. I believe in America, but I'm not an American because I believe in it. There's a process if I want that. I have to go through a process to be uh, accepted into another race or culture. And most, even Australia's got the same uh, rules. If you're going to come here and be an Australian, you've got a process to go through. You can't just come here and call yourself an Australian. It doesn't work that way. And you can't just call yourself a Christian because you believe in God or feel good about God or because your mother was this or your father was that or whatever. That is not God's way. God will back it up with his sign, his way, when you do it his way. And it's just so simple. That's what Paul said. You repent, you get baptised, and what do you see here happening? It will happen to you too. And on that day, 3,000 people heard and saw what was done, and they all did it, and 3,000 people were added to the church, all speaking in tongues, because God is consistent. Now, we'll just go to another point. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. Just going to go through a, a basic... that. that Tongues is a language designed by and for God. God designed a tongue. The language we speak, more than likely, there's no two the same. It's a bit like snowflakes. They reckon no two snowflakes have exactly the same geometric pattern. And no one's ever found two patterns yet. Maybe there are, I don't know. But uh, the language God designs for us, a personalised language, and you'll see why in a moment the depth of the power of that language and what it achieves once God's given it to us is quite, quite remarkable. In fact, it's mind-blowing. And it's a miracle in its own right and it's a servant to us. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men. End of story. He who speaks... If you speak in tongues, which you do when you receive the Spirit, it's not a language meant to be spoken to men. 
Even though the people understood some of the language and some of the words, God didn't design the language to be a communication between people and people. It was always between him and us individually. So not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit, in the spiritual realm where this language is working, you speak mysteries. Blessings and power are happening at a level which is beyond you. Sometimes people think, well, what's the point? What's the point? Hey, I'll tell you what the point is, I'll show you. Who knows what that is? Notice there's no camera. It's a phone. When I push this, it does things. I haven't got a clue what's happening from when I push it and it says yes or no. I just go yes or no. I don't know the mathematics behind it. I don't know the pathways of all the signals. I don't know how it's linking out to the town, linking back again. I don't know how it selects your number if I ring you and gets to you and somehow your voice gets converted electronically into this and it's into the system and out of the system and the CIA record everything you say. I don't know how all that happens. All I know is if I do it, it happens. Now, when we speak in tongues, I don't know all the spiritual things which are happening behind the scenes with God and heaven and Jesus Christ and all the heavenly hosts. All I know is that when we speak in tongues, he does it. I don't need to know the spiritual technology behind it. And I've been told that very clearly, that it's a mystery. It's a mystery. We're not meant to know. All we know is it works. And we're pretty good at using technology that works, aren't we? Cars full of it, houses full of it, your microwave oven, air conditioner, you can sort of sit here, get your phone out, reset your air conditioner at home, and when you get home, it's turned on. There it is. I'm just waiting for one for my wife. Happy, smiling, dinner cooked. Anyway, someone comes up with that, they make a fortune. She's waiting for one for the husband, by the way. Two-way street. So we have this, and the Lord said, we speak of mysteries... He that speaketh an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. No man understands him, but the technology of the Spirit, to use that word, simply is that God knows, and he works with it. Let's go to John 4, 24. John 4, 24. Another spiritual truth, simple to read, easy to understand. We read here, God is the Spirit, and they that worship him... Notice the word here, worship. That means to serve spiritually. They that worship him must, the word must here means no options, must worship him and spirit in spirit and in truth. Well, how do you worship the Lord in spirit and in truth? Some people say, I just talk to God. Yeah, well, that's fine. Is that in spirit? That's in natural thinking, not in spirit. In the spirit's another technology it's another spiritual level but God goes on to explain what he meant here so we just have a rule here that says that they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth it's not an option so let's let's have a verse and it's the only verse in the new testament which actually clarifies what worshiping in the spirit is let's have a look at 1 corinthians 14 14 again a single scripture defining a direction which God has given And he says here in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, he said, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, what happens? My spirit prayeth. My spirit prayeth. But my understanding is unfruitful, which is a confirmation of what we've already read. When you move into the spirit, it's not about what's happening in your head, it's what God is doing with the spirit, a custom designed language for your life, which God will work with through you and all your particular requirements and it will work on your behalf perfectly if you use it. And that's what God said about it, custom designed, one-on-one, us and God. And that's how God works with us. So that's a very powerful observation. Now, with those sort of general basics out of the way, let's move on to the purposing of tongues. The first one I'd like to give you is that it's a consistent God-given sign. Let's have a look in Mark 16, 17, where Jesus actually revealed uh, this very clearly towards the end of his life on the earth. He said here, and these signs shall follow them that believe. A lot of people claim they believe, but believing and accepting are really not how the Bible talks. 
The word believing in the Bible simply means those who really commit themselves in action to what they believe, not just those who give sort of some mental uh, acceptance towards a theory or a power or whatever. Uh, we, we all believe a lot of things, but in the Bible, if you believe something, you do it. And that's what the Lord's referring to. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They'll cast out devils and what else? They will speak with new tongues. I could equally say that those who do not believe will not speak in new tongues because it's only for those who do believe. So it becomes a Bible definition of those who actually truly believe. A lot of people say they believe and we're not here to pick on them. It's not our job. Our job is simply to believe what God says and do our best to uh, keep putting these truths forward and let people make their choice. Remember, the sample of life was put in your letterbox for you to choose. God's not going to force anyone to take the product of eternal life. Eternal life is a personal choice. And the same as walking in the Lord and overcoming, it's a personal choice. And you've got total control of your choices all your life until your life ends. And God's saying to you, make the best choices because there's no round two when round one finishes if you didn't make the right choices. And that's a, a simple Bible truth. John 3, 7. Very early in his ministry, as John recorded these statements, he said here, Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. So now he's speaking about the process of where speaking in tongues comes as evidence that you've been born again. Being born again, being filled with the Spirit, um, this terminology just sort of is interchangeable. This simply means to be saved. And people today, they've got salvation divided up into five or six different levels and it's just so, so difficult. No wonder confusion reigns in the world of religion and people trying to find God. God's given us the sign you receive when you receive the Holy Spirit. Very clearly laid out to find what it does, how it works, the purpose of it, and to go outside of this range of expectation and uh, description won't go well for us. And it won't go well for the people who follow what we believe if we don't believe the truth. So he says in John 3, 7, he said, Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind, meaning the spirit, it blows where it chooses, where it listers. And he's giving this metaphor for the coming of the Holy Spirit. You might remember on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, it was like a mighty rushing wind came and sat upon it. Well, the wind was a metaphor. The word wind is spirit, pneuma which the word spirit is in the Bible. Holy spirit is like holy wind or holy, the movement of life. And that's just another way of expressing it. He said here, the spirit or the wind bloweth where it chooses and you hear the sound thereof or the voice of it, but you can't tell where it comes and whither it goes. You can't see it coming. You can't see it going. You can only hear the sound of it. And so it wasn't a day at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came on 120 people. No one could see the Spirit, but it came and sat upon all of them to use their metaphor. They all spoke in tongues, all 120 of them. And uh, it's come and uh, we have the same thing in our fellowship, that when we witness to people, no matter what country we're in around the world, even in Nepal, Brother David yesterday was out there and he's got 15 or 20 new people ready to either pray or join in or d take some sort of spiritual advice. And the common thing is they're all speaking in tongues when they receive the Holy Spirit. Why? Because God said it. Why? Because they get told what God said. And when they know what God said and what the Bible pattern is, if they conform, God will work with them. If they don't conform, nothing happens. And you can go about and you can believe whatever you like, but your belief is irrelevant to what God is doing if you're on two different pages. And this is why God wants us to confirm our walk with the Bible principles which are provable and able to be established because we've been asked to take the same principle out to the rest of the world. So he says here, everyone that's basically in this position, born again, you hear the sound, you can't tell whether it's coming or where it goes, so is who? Every, the, the scripture said, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Not some of them, not a few of them. Everyone that is born of the Spirit, simply saved or born again or Spirit-filled, whichever term you like to use, which is the same event, everyone, not some of them. This idea that you received the Holy Spirit today and three years later you received the gift of speaking in tongues or healing is sort of some additive to 
further mentor your ability to serve the Lord. That's not what the Bible says. That's a religious error which is conveniently used because they're quite often people are too afraid to lay down the Bible pattern because a lot of the people in their fellowship will just walk out. They will call it quits and leave because they don't want to hear that. They want to hear what they want to believe. And fortunately, um, I think our church is built on people who want to hear what God believes, not what they believe. And that's why we've probably done well through uh, the, the, all the nations where people have adhered because everyone born of the Spirit has a consistent, a consistent experience and event. Next point, tongues is a language of prayer. First point was a sign. And not only is it a sign to you, but it's a sign to others that, all right, you've, you know you're doing it. You know in yourself that you're praying in the Spirit. And most of us here can remember the first time they received this, when they received the Spirit, they spoke in tongues, and it was just, wow, where would that come from? But other people here, and they know you've received equally. But the important thing is you know because you know whether you're bunging it on or not. No one else knows, but you know, and that's important. It's a language of prayer. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 9. Just as a brief lead-in, he said here, I'm sorry if I'm a little bit ahead of the words. I've got a little bit too much to get through to rely on the, the scripture coming up. I, they might get it up in time, I don't know. Zephaniah 3, 9, for, he said, For then I will turn to the people a pure language, that they may all um, call upon my name, it's call, sorry, call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. So Zephaniah, hundreds of years before Jesus Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit, is already telling them that they would be granted a language which would be spiritually pure, which would link them all together with one consent. It's almost like we would all be spiritually yoked together. Already prophesied. And that's what's happened. Every one of us is uniquely linked together by the fact that God has given us consistently a language of prayer which we can all use to serve God. Romans 8, 26. Another confirmation in the New Testament with a little bit more detail. In fact, it's very clear detail of how praying in the Spirit or speaking in tongues actually benefits us. And he says here, Romans 8, 26, he says, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. It's very easy to misinterpret the word infirmities to mean sickness, but it doesn't actually mean sickness. It means weakness. Just areas where you're not as strong as you might be or areas where you're failing in. So the Spirit itself helps our weaknesses. He goes to say, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. This is spoken to people who are spirit-filled, who know God, who have miracles and signs and wonders as part of their life, and he's clearly saying that there's a level of communication which we can't achieve in human form, even filled with the Spirit, through natural circumstances. Unless spiritual intervention occurs, we cannot please God and get required outcomes. So he goes on to express this point, for we know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself, meaning the Holy Spirit, maketh intercession for us with groanings or words or supplications which cannot be uttered, which we can't naturally speak. They are words which we cannot speak on our own. They are supernaturally granted. And he that searcheth the hearts, the Holy Spirit, knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints. How? According to the will of God. This is God's will that the Spirit in you would communicate with God in this language of purity on our behalf, dealing with infirmities or weaknesses which we can't even get our mind around on some occasions. Now, if you're sick and you need a healing, we know that. If you need a better job or you're looking, whatever purpose in life, but at any natural level and some spiritual levels, we can define in our words and speak them. And God will honour that. But a lot of us do not know spiritually what our next step is. Some of us are thinking, oh, I'd love to do this in the Lord. I'm looking for a job to do in the Lord and I want to do this and I don't. And God's going, whoa, 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 let the spirit talk. I've got another role for you. You don't even know what it is yet and you'll never know until you let the Lord take you there. And the best way to let the Lord take you somewhere is to pray in the spirit. 
talk to him in his language. Why? Because it deals with the issues that we can't. It knows the problems of tomorrow that we don't even know. It deals with issues which are beyond us. The Spirit searches our heart and there's things in us which the Lord sees that we could not identify. And sometimes out of bias, sometimes out of ignorance, sometimes we think we're no good and sometimes we, we think we're too good. But the Lord cuts through all that and says, no, 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 I'll just lay it on the line how it needs to be laid out in a perfect way so that you are blessed and dealt with the best way possible spiritually. And this is what he's saying here. The Spirit does this. Purpose of that, it's a language of prayer. Last point, it's a gift used in the meeting. Tongues also comes into level three now. And 1 Corinthians 14, 6, just a simple little metaphor as we go through the value and purpose of tongues where Paul goes through some of these things. In 1, 1 Corinthians 14, it's a whole chapter basically on using the free voice gifts in the church where he reasons with the people why it is good for them to be searching out the gifts of the Spirit in the meeting. This is not saying that you should be seeking to speak in tongues because he's already covered. This is now in the meeting that tongues need to be sought in interpretation and prophecy. So he's speaking to people who already do speak in tongues, but they don't know how necessarily to use it in the format which would work at the time of the gifts. So he says, well, if you're going to use a tongue, that's good, but you need to have an interpretation, otherwise no one benefits. Then uh, after that, he brought forward three prophecies of the maximum number they could have in any one meeting would be three. And that then establishes the three voice gifts, which are tongues, interpretation, and prophecy, which are three of the nine gifts clearly defined in the scriptures, which is part of everyone's life if they choose to use it. Every one of us has a, a, a tongue. Every one of us has a psalm. Every one of us has a prophecy. It's up to us whether we utilize it. And that's the encouragement in 1 Corinthians to move past nervousness or self-doubt or whatever and start letting God work with you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? And even things without life-giving sound, whether they be pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sound, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? At the time of the gifts, the Corinthian church were using tongues and they didn't understand that the next step was to interpret the tongue and they didn't understand that prophecy could equally be used at this time. So Paul defines all these things through this chapter, which is a whole talk in itself. He simply says, guys... If when you come together, you've got, all got a tongue, and if the, the time and the gifts, one of you uses a tongue and the other one uses a tongue, he said, what benefit is it to the people there? Only you get a blessing from it because you're speaking in tongues, but no one knows what's being said. So what are you going to do about it? So he goes on and expresses the correct procedure, how the tongue would be followed by the interpretation. So the point being here is it is also a gift in the meeting. I'm just only establishing that, not establishing all the guidelines that go with it, but tongues would be a gift at this particular time. In verse 18 in the same chapter, Paul goes on to say, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, in other words, at the time of the spiritual voice gifts, particularly in this instance, I would rather speak five words of my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So he clearly identifies the benefit in the voice gifts of having a tongue, was assigned to the unbeliever, but then having an interpretation which would bring edify, edifying words to everyone who believed, etc., etc. So these things are there that we might understand the ebbing and flowing of how the gifts of the Spirit would work. But an interesting point here is, um, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. I think it's pretty presumptuous that Paul would conclude that he spoke in tongues more than everyone else. That, that's almost like bragging. Have a bit of a think about it because there's two ways to interpret this verse. Can I, could I honestly say to God here, unknowing your prayer life, saying, oh, I praise God, I pray in tongues more than all of you? I can't say that because I don't know. But if I say, I thank God I can pray in tongues more than all of you, in other words, I'm so aware of the value of tongues, 
I thank God for the value of that tongue, perhaps more than all of you. Why? Because at this stage, you don't understand the value of what that tongue is. I could truly say, I praise God I have an understanding of tongues more than a lot of you. And I believe that's the point he's making. But it's the point he wants them to understand what he understands so they can all be in an equal place. That's just a, a throw in as a point of interest for you if you've worked that one out. Ephesians 6 verse 18. He says here, Ephesians 6.18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. This was another letter to the church, another letter to the people where he's following the same theme and he said to all of them that he would, that they always had their prayer in the spirit and watching thereunto with perseverance, in other words, be a regular speaker in tongues, and also making supplication for all saints, being a person who not only spoke in the Spirit and allowed the Spirit to do the things we've read, but being aware physically also of the other ones and putting natural supplications to all people uh, in the Spirit. So why do we have so many people having a problem with tongues? Quite often people say, oh, all you revival people ever do is talk about speaking in tongues. No, it's not. We talk about all nine gifts of the Spirit, it's just it's a bit hard to avoid tongues when it's the initial sign of receiving the Holy Spirit and it's even harder still to avoid it when they want to argue about that one point and none of the others. By default it almost becomes a point of discussion, not because we choose. I would equally choose with you as we're reading through all of this today to talk about all of the things. But if we're going to talk about salvation, we're going to talk about repentance, we're going to talk about water baptism and we're going to talk about Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. And if you're out there evangelising and sharing the true gospel of Jesus Christ, nearly every sentence you say to new people is going to be filled with words which we're talking today. So by natural default, you're always going to be speaking about speaking in tongues, the anointing and baptism. Why? Because it's the message of the gospel. So this criticism that the only thing you ever do is speak about it is a false argument. It's a false argument. What it simply means is they're never talking about it and that is their problem, not mine. But sadly, it's a problem of those who listen and only go along and give their heart to the Lord and make a fuzzy-wuzzy description of their salvation and feel real good, and that's their life. We, we know that God offers better than that. It's not an insult to be short of the plan of God. It's an insult when you refuse to change, and that's what we need to consider. Let's have a look. Jude 1. In fact, I'll let you turn to any chapter of Jude you like. Then we're going to read verse 18. And he goes on here to say, How that when they told you there should be mockers in the last time, this is referring to those who had mocked the Christian message, and quite often the mocking comes from within, not just without. In fact, I can prove to you scripturally that the greatest enemies of the church are spirit-filled people who refuse to walk in the truth. And the Bible defines it very clearly, but... Today is not that day because, again, it's another full talk in its own. He said, Mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts, these be they who separate themselves. In other words, they have come out from this world or come out from the church in, in another, whatever way it is, their natural choosing of their ego, sensual, meaning natural, having not the direction of the spirit, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. How clearer do you need to get than that? How do you pray in the Holy Ghost? Paul said, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. No other verse in the New Testament explains it. That's the only time it's clearly written, and then we can go to these other verses and tie it into the same theme. Think about that. Now, praying always with all prayer and supplication. The Bible says there are going to be mockers, and we face them. We've had them in our own church. We've had them. They're all over the place. And the, the Lord has sort of dealt with that. There's a couple of different ways the Lord explains the mockers. The concept of antichrist, this world likes to build a whole revelation, scripture, prophecy on the antichrist, this evil ruler is going to come upon the earth and wreak havoc and all that. The word antichrist does not appear in the book of Revelation at all. It's not there. But Paul does speak about it 
himself, it's in Thessalonians particularly what I'm referring to, and he says that there are many, we're going back now to the first century, not the year 2020 or 25, whenever this supposed horror event's going to occur, and he speaks about this time coming uh, where people would deny God. But it was already happening in the first century. He said there are already many antichrists. They were of us and have come out from us. Antichrist is made up of two words. Anti, which means instead of or against. Christos is the anointing. So they have a doctrine which is in place of the anointing. So they say you've got to give your heart to the Lord. Make a decision for Christ. Walk in the way of God. Read your Bible. But you don't need to speak in tongues. In other words, you don't need the Holy Spirit and the proof. You can do whatever you like. As long as you sort of steer towards Bible beliefs or principles, you'll be fine. And God says, sorry, doesn't wash. That is not how you get saved. So Antichrist is one Bible definition of people who came out from us, they're not of us, and by moving away from sound doctrine, they prove that they're not of us and they prove where their heart really is. And some of these people can be the most pleasant and friendly people in the world. In fact, for some of us, sadly, some of these people are our own family members, which is even more tragic, but doesn't alter what God says. On another occasion, Paul quotes the book of Isaiah, with stammering lips and other tongue will I speak to this people, which is a principle of how we would provide a prayer language, how we would provide signs and interpretation of that sign and blessing and basically the three facets of the Holy Spirit, proof of you've got tongues and how it works. And he said, for all that, they'll not hear me. Hey, I've given them signs, but they won't hear me. In other words, they will reject the truth of spiritual observation exactly the same in principle as antichrist in other words instead of christos anything bar tongues anything bar this they got the signs they got the wonders but they'll still reject me and that is the concept and the principle in which those scriptures lay that church people will reject the truth of god simply because in their heart they don't want to go along with it and we we can't alter that because it's a choice we all make if I have to make a choice, what I'm going to do, I'd rather choose something which God backs than something which I personally believe. But a lot of people today will choose their personal beliefs rather than what God says, simply because they'd rather have their life, to, in their own words, they'd rather have their life to themselves and not be bound by this God, which is an ego problem. You can't, you can't choose that life. If you want to have eternal life, then do it God's way. Hey, is our life so miserable? We, we are very happy people. We have the most wonderful life. We've had all, what have I ever had to give up, which I really didn't want to? When I came to the church, smoking was gone, drinking was gone. I, I think of all the money I might have saved, the health benefits of not having those things sitting on me. I, I don't want to drink or smoke. And even if I did, God's take, we have testimonies of people, are alcoholics, where God just simply took away the desire to drink. They weren't even aware we got testimonies, my own mother and my uh, Cheryl's father, uh, testimonies of people who just gave up smoking. He hadn't smoked his pipe for two weeks. He didn't even know till he realised it was still sitting in his ashtray. Why? Because the Lord took it off them and healed them from it. That's how the Lord worked. Okay, we've sort of gone a bit over time. Um, I was going to deal with some of the arguments against tongues. Some people say tongues have done away with. Well, there's a, a scripture in Corinthians which says that when that which is perfect is come, then these things shall be done away with. But it goes on to talk about knowledge and prophecy. But knowledge hasn't been done away with. It's just a false argument. It, it doesn't hold water. So that's on the notes. Another one, which is the one I love the most, is tongues is from Satan. You know, like this is the biggest argument they've got, the slam dunk, tongues is from Satan. Show me one verse. It's not even mentioned. They get into the Old Testament, they convolute this and that and link it up with temple prostitutes and temple priests and it's, it's just simply not there. And probably the other argument that I wanted to deal with was, uh, you know, for preaching to the unsaved. God gives you a language to talk to people who you can talk to them in their own language and you can go and witness to them. But on the day of Pentecost, let's just look at this logically. People were there who understood the languages 
okay, they still had to go up to Peter in the end and say, what does this mean? They had a natural language. They didn't need these languages to be proselytised or witnessed to. They already knew what was being said by Peter because I asked him. And look, just simple logic says, if the tongue was given to a person so they could witness to their friends back home in, say, Greece, when they'd speak Greek or whatever, how does that marry up with all these verses we just looked at about what tongues does and works? It doesn't work with them. It's contrary to all of them. So that argument is a false argument. But it's also false logically because they had to say at the end of it, what meaneth this? And if you think about it, let's think about this. God has given me a language, and I've spoken to Brother Mick here, and I've spoken to Mick in Italian, you know, very clear Italian, a little bit better than he speaks. And there I am speaking to him in this wonderful, pure language of Italian. And in the end, he's going, wow, praise God. He spoke spiritual truths. He spoke words of edification and blessing in the spirit. But I haven't got a clue what he meant. Because that's what they said. What mean of this? So Peter then came along and said, well, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. He went through the prophecy. Then at the end of it, they said, well, what are we going to do? And he said, well, you." he was speaking probably in Hebrew in the natural language which they all understood when they gathered on the day of Pentecost because they had to have a common language to be in the temple and deal with the temple issues that God required. And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. So this argument that they were given a language and they could go off and speak to as someone of another country and they would then be witness to and understand it and that it just doesn't hold water at any level of logic. But some people believe it. And the only reason I'm mentioning it is because it gives you an opportunity to refute the argument because I, I would believe that if God failed, if I was speaking to Mick in Italian and he didn't have a clue what I was saying, would, could I logically accept the fact that God speaking through me failed to get through to this guy and yet Peter speaking in a mixed second language got through 100%. That's an insult to God. It really is an insult to God. But sometimes it's the best argument that people have. The last argument, and we'll close after this, is um, Jesus said, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto them but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And I've had that one thrown at me a couple of times. What did he answer when they asked that question? They wanted him to prove that he was the Christ, not that he was saved, not that he was spirit-filled. They wanted him to prove that he was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He responded to that by saying there's going to be no other sign, and the sign of the prophet Jonah was he was three days in the grave and he came back to life. That is the metaphor of the whale and under the water. And that Now, they, they wanted a sign. What about the tens of thousands of people he healed? What about the two lots of thousands of people he fed? What about walking on water? What about, they didn't count them as signs. They wanted a sign. In other words, they wanted him to do it their way and he wouldn't do it their way. He just simply said, hey, when it comes to the question of the son of God, this is the way I'm doing it. This question about I'll give you no other sign has nothing to do with our salvation has nothing to do with our walk in the Lord by explaining what we have or don't have in the spirit and it's nothing to do with any debate about being born again it was simply a question about him having to prove that he was the son of God and he rejected their argument anyway and we reject their argument equally if they try and use that because God has given me my sign and he's given you your sign and if you don't have your sign God will give it to you all you need to do as we've said today is repent Get baptised in water and you too will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And all the people said, Amen. Let's pray.